Steve said, this won't come on right away. You've got to give it time. Thank you, Stephen. So, spoiler alert. They get married and live in that house. Seniors, do you have your one-year goal? Your five-year goal? Your ten-year goal? Are you really ready to graduate without a one-year goal, a five-year goal, and a ten-year goal? Underclassmen, are you building your networks? I know you are. I get your LinkedIn requests. <laughs> Freshmen, have you figured out how your Trinity education is going to provide for you after graduation? Now, if you're listening to the scripture reading uh, this morning, you might be wondering, what's the point of these questions anymore? Or maybe you have found that little way to hedge your bets by saying, if the Lord wills, today as we spend this time in, uh, in this part of James's instruction, we want to ask what it means to be steadfast as we consider our future. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we pray that we will do our best to present ourselves to you as those who are approved, who need not to be ashamed as we handle the word of truth. Uh, Lord, that we will grow in godliness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me begin with my personal story. Um, some of you know that I'm married to my wife, Karen. We've been married a long time. See, Billy Outbreaker, it took me two sentences to get to my wife. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, Karen and I were married while we were still in college. We were really young. And, um, and when we went to talk to her father about that and ask his blessing, he kind of shook his head and said, well, you can always live on love. Um, he knew with my interests and focus, the things I thought I was going to do with my life, that making a, quote, good living was never an option for me. It was hardly a goal and probably wasn't really an option. But we were married and uh, finished our way through school and thought that we would um, uh, get through school, go to Venezuela, become a, a music teacher at a missionary kids' school. My colleague, uh, Dr. Robel, actually did that, but it was part of my plan. We were, we were classmates back in the day. Uh, we knew we'd have to be debt-free and that would probably have to mean raising support, but that's what we thought we would do. It's what we knew we wanted to do. But first, we had to finish school, and there's that debt that you have to pay off before you can go, to mission, to go on the mission field. Um, we didn't know that during school my interests would change. It would become clear to me that I probably would be, if not the worst, one of the worst middle school band directors you can imagine. Uh, maybe that wasn't going to be the way I was going to go. Uh, as a married person uh, studying a, a performance medium, it became clear that a lot of my peers who were performers, who made their living by performing, um, had a, a, a trail of a ruined relationships behind them. That seemed a dangerous way to go. So we're constantly navigating this path. What are we going to do? I mean, what can you do um, with a music degree? I have a son about whom uh, I used to joke, uh, what do you tell, uh, um, who, what kind of parent says to their children, why don't you do, study something practical like music? The parents of a theater major, that was my son. So, uh, so I have a son who understands this gig. But, um, so, uh, and uh, interests change as they do. And then after grad school and, and kind of taking an off-ramp after a master's degree, um, starting work, and God brought children um, all, these, all these plans seemed to be sidetracked, derailed. Uh, it seemed like every year there was a new plan to work out. Compared to my, my, my friend BJ, who um, was at high school with me, who followed a year after me into Bible school at Moody, and um, BJ had a life plan, and he was married a couple years. He and Mary were married a couple years after Karen and me, and we were their older married couple friends. You know, we were 22 or something like that, and, and uh, they had us over for dinner, and, and they sat us down after dinner, and they wanted to talk about their life, how they do their life plan. What are they going to do? And Byron had a steno, you don't know what a steno pad. He had a notebook that uh, he had all of his questions written out in, and, and his, little, his little life plan worked out. And we just thought, that was funny. How can you, you don't, you don't plan life that way. Well, actually, B.J. did plan his life that way, and he kind of tracked it out. And, and uh, it, it became clear to us that, oh, this way that we're navigating life isn't necessarily the way to navigate life. We learned to say, if God wills, 
And we learn to plan and to be open to surprise. And as I look at our passage today, what James is saying here, um, he seems to be suggesting that there may not be one best way to look at the future. So what is James saying here? A few observations about the book of James, and you've heard some of these, I'm sure, from from other, from previous faculty in this series. The purpose of the letter of James um, is to is written to Jewish Christians dispersed around the region. I think it was meant as a guide, an instruction book for those who are new in the Christian faith. Martin Luther, the the famous reformer, called it an epistle of straw. That is not high praise, epistle of straw. Um, He wasn't willing to say it didn't belong in the Christian canon, but he wasn't sure it should be foregrounded. Um, I think he might have, boy, who am I to say Martin Luther might have been confused, but I think he misunderstood, he was comparing James to the letters of of Paul and found it didn't stand up in the same way. Perhaps missing the point that James is more like the Old Testament book of Proverbs than it is like the book of Romans. I think it has some themes in it, uh, but it doesn't unfold sequentially. I, often we're told that the book of James, the theme is faith that works. This was Martin Luther's stumbling block, right? The whole notion of works in there. I, I love the theme that has been selected for us this semester, steadfast, just a simple word, steadfast. I think the theme for me can be summarized in, uh, in the first chapter, the second verse, and also the ending of the book, um, where, where we're instructed to, about meeting the trials, the testing of our faith. And as we think about being steadfast, um, it's, it's a question of how are we going to approach these, these trials, these testings of our faith? How are we going to remain firm in that? Um, I think there's some challenges in understanding any of these passages that we're looking at, trying to make the letter unfold like an epistle. You know, point A goes to point B, points to point C, Roman numeral two, we move on. Um, that can be a problem. Um, reading James, or especially the Proverbs, its model in the Old Testament, like it's a how-to manual, can be problematic. The, the Proverbs don't work like that as how-to. Um, they're guides to wisdom. I think James is a guide to Christian wisdom. I think another challenge is to confuse the imperatives, the you should or you shall not, those, those statements, with things we have to do to be saved. And James certainly is not uh, guilty of, uh, of what we would call works righteousness here. If there's a theological core to the book, I think it's this. If anyone thinks he or she is religious, but ignores widows and orphans, then his, religious is wor- his religion is worthless. And I think we can take that theological idea and apply it through many of the themes that have come up in our series this semester. If I think I'm religious, but I do this or I don't do that, my religion might just be worthless. So what's the context of the passage that Mackenzie read today? Um, It's maybe a a, a fool's errand to look for context in any of the given uh, passages uh, because, again, the book is not really meant to work that way. Um, But I think there is an overall context for the verses that we're looking at today. And I think that context is one of the question of humility. Chapter 4, verse 1 begins, What causes quarrels and fights? Uh, chapter 4, verse 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Chapter 4, verse 10, who are you to judge your neighbor? These are questions that are, uh, that are presented to make us question our, our spirit, our humility before our brothers and sisters in Christ and before God. And in our passage, we read that, uh, that this question of planning for our future, uh, he they said, they says, so all such boasting is arrogance. There's that idea of humility again. And chapter, fun, what, chapter 5 then uh, follows fast on the heels. Come now, you rich, weep and howl. And uh, there is these, this, uh, this, this issue of humility of those who have much in the world's goods and are not humble toward brothers and sisters in Christ. Is James saying it's wrong to have a business plan, wrong to make money? Um, Even if I thought that's what he was saying, I wouldn't want to say so in a place with such a fine business department as we have here, um, with uh, with my excellent colleagues there. But is that what he's saying here? Um, Paul said to Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. But Jesus said, make friends of the world's goods. 
use the world's resources to do good for the kingdom. In the Old Testament, um, wealth, comfort, um, even the idea of being, quote, fat, are signs of God's blessings, that, uh, that these things, this, the, the notion of having things itself is not what James is talking about there. Is James suggesting that because life is short and unpredictable, we shouldn't plan at all? I don't think so. He says, instead of this grand plan that you were saying, I'm going to go to another city for a year, I'm going to do business and make money, and then I'll come back. Basically, he's saying, I'm going to go make a killing. I'm going to retire as a millionaire at age 30. I'm going to establish my own company and be, be well off. Um, uh, instead, you ought to say, I'd like to do these things if the Lord wills. This is my plan if the Lord wills. But what does he mean when he tells us? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. Um, this so easily becomes a cliche for us. Um, a, 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 little, a little phrase we tag on the end of our prayers. Lord, and we do it all, in all kinds of ways. We pray for someone's health and we pray if it be your will. We pray for... Um, for, for our a job if we, in a certain place, or a, a vocation, a career, if it be your will. We pray for certain actions, certain things we want in our life, and we tag it on, if it be your will, almost like the phrase, in Jesus' name, and kind of not thinking about it maybe, but just saying, oh, it's, it's something we're supposed to do when we pray. Um, in our worst, at our worst moments, it might be a passive-aggressive prayer. I want to do these things, Lord, if it's your will. I've been good enough to tell you what I want to do. I made it clear what I want in my life. Now, if it's your will, that'll happen. Um, that's in our worst case. I, I don't know. That's not preaching to anybody in this choir. But, uh, um, but it's more than a cliche. It's, it's more than a cliche. And... Um, and, and it stands as a contrast to the kind of arrogant, boastful planning that the first part of our passage, um, um, that the first part of our passage talks about. So when is our planning arrogant and boastful? And what can we do about that? Here's George Bailey again. Now you listen to me. I don't want any plastics, and I don't want any ground floors, and I don't want to get married ever to anyone. You understand that? I want to do what I want to do. And cut before the mo one of the most desperate kisses in the history of American cinema. <laughs> and spoiler alert, they still get married and live in that old house. So. I want to do what I want to do. I think uh, George Bailey has uh, um, succinctly expressed the arrogance and boasting that comes with some of our planning. I want to do what I want to do. Have you ever made a plan and stuck to it when it was obviously the wrong thing? Um, a number of years ago now, I was uh, approaching the, a decade of, of full-time ministry in the first church that I served, and I was restless. I was unhappy with some things. Um, um, and I did something that, uh, that I'd never done before. I went to the want ads um, to look for something else to do. Specifically, I went to Christianity Today, you know, sacred want ads, and uh, looked under the ministry opportunities and looked to see were churches looking for a pastor for music and worship. It's what I could do, and I desperately hoped that maybe God would lead me to do it in a different church. Um, shame on me. Um, there, was a, there was a notice there, a church quite a bit smaller than the church I served, in another region of the country. I was in Minnesota. This was in North Carolina. That had its appeal. I could bicycle 11 months out of the year in North Carolina instead of the three months of the year in Minnesota. Um, but the church itself was described well in my initial context with it. A, a wonderful connection with the senior pastor. We were invited down to interview and to meet people, and we went down. And over the course of our long weekend, I was drawn farther and farther into this process. And Karen was becoming more and more uh, withdrawn from the process. She was more withdrawn into herself. We flew back, an awful flight back from uh, North Carolina to uh, Minnesota. You can't fly direct, you have to go through Detroit. We sat in the back row, all legs of this trip. 
we're really cheap travelers. And, um, and when you work for a church, that's what you do. And, um, and, and we barely talked on the way back. Uh, and we love to travel together. We love to talk when we travel. And we didn't talk much. And it became, it was already obvious, but as the days went by after our return to Minnesota, the tension in our marriage really deepened. Uh, Karen, unusually, atypically for her, dug in her heels. Um, I, I desperately wanted to, I desperately wanted to make this move. And we weren't coming to a point of agreement about it. Um, I finally, and this is the work of the Holy Spirit, because it is not um, natural for me, I finally had to recognize that uh, I needed to honor Karen's reservations about this. I had to trust that, that her feelings were driven by some, something from the Holy Spirit, um, and I needed to take, I needed to step back, I needed to honor her, and I needed to withdraw from, from, this, uh, from this, the potential of this position. Um, that was really hard. It was the most difficult time in our marriage, um, and in some ways it was the most strengthening time in our marriage. Um, it was a plan which, had I stuck to it, would, obvious, would have been the wrong thing. Somehow Karen knew that weeks before I did, or at least weeks before I was willing to admit it. And, um, and the next stage of our life, when we settled back into the ministry that we had, and then two years later, God wonderfully led us into a different place where I served for 16 years with great satisfaction and joy, um, to dig in to the wrong plan, as, I want, as, as sometimes we often hear, to be successful at the wrong thing. Um, have you ever done that? Have you ever been committed to a plan and stuck to it, even when you f- began to think, well, maybe this is wrong? There's an Italian proverb, it's a bad plan that cannot be changed. Our planning for the future might be flawed if we're not steadfast uh, to do what the Lord wills today. The rich man in in Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 12 uh, had this fabulous uh, intake of of, uh, harvest. And he said, what will I do? I know, I'll build me more barns. I'm just going to store this stuff up. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to make a million. And Jesus said, you fool. Jesus doesn't say you fool a lot. You fool. Tonight, your soul is required of you. This is the issue that, that James is addressing. So our planning just might be flawed if we're not steadfast to do what the Lord wills today. Now, we can't just cover our tracks with the cliche if the Lord wills. We cannot say it is impossible to know for sure what God wants us to do. Does God really care what you do for a job, whether you have a vocation in ministry, where you go on vacation or on mission? Does he care how much I weigh? I struggle with weight all my life. How much does he care? Uh, Does he care whom you marry? Here's what we know. We know that we are called by God to work at what matters that's compatible with the goals of his kingdom. We know that we are to work well to please one master. We know that we are to do no harm, to earn our pay, to not cheat our employers, to not take advantage of the poor. Those things we know about our work and our calling. Are we faithful to those? We know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that gluttony is a sin. So if the, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and I'm overweight, but I'm not a glutton, does God care? I mean, he cares nearly as much as I do about myself. Um, he knows about our relationship, and we know that we're not to be unequally yoked, that we shouldn't marry people who do, do not share our faith in Christ. We know that we should be partnered with those who will help us keep our life in line with God's purposes. We know that, how, man, how we love our spouse is to be like how Christ loves the church. Does God have a one single person for you to live out marriage in that way? Maybe not. Um, but, but we do know how we are to be in marriages, in work, and in the way we care for ourselves. Are we getting ready to do the good we know we ought to do? Are we, are we prepared to do the right thing now? In the book of Genesis, we learn that we are made in God's image, which is meant to be, mean that we are made to be God's ambassadors, to take care of his stuff. Um, 
Are we, how are we doing that now? Uh, the prophet Micah says, he has shown you what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to love kindness, to do justice, and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, don't worry about tomorrow, it has enough trouble of its own. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. What other things? Oh, little things like food, clothes, a shelter over your head. All these things will be given to you. Paul says to the Philippian Christians, think on these things in a list of how, where we are to set our mind. These are things we know that we're called to do. Are we faithful to do them now? James ends this par- portion of the letter, whoever knows the right thing to do or the good we ought to do and doesn't do it for him or, or it is sin. This letter is filled with knowing the right thing to do. Just from chapter one, ask God for wisdom. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Put away trashy talk. Do what the word says. Don't just hear it and let it go. Um, Discipline your tongue. Take care of orphans and widows. That's just chapter one. There's all these things that we can gauge ourselves. We We can say, I'm not doing so well on this. I'm working on that. I, didn't really, I really stink at this. This isn't going well at all for me. We know the good we ought to do. When we are doing the right thing, taking the next right step, and that is when, when we are being steadfast today, when we're doing the good we ought to do, other less obvious decisions and choices, I think, have a new clarity for us. I'll be taking, um, uh, well, taking this position that I'm offered, Come with the expectation that I will favor the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Um, Little sidebar here. That can happen in a ministry position, too. It isn't just in worldly um, uh, employment that we sometimes are faced with this challenge. We can be in a ministry setting that favors the wealthy over the poor. Oh, come sit down up front, James says. The rich person, he says, you're doing this in your church. But the poor person, go ahead, just take a row in the back, you know. That happens. Um, Will taking this position put me in a position? um, Taking this job, this ministry, put me in a position like that? Will my wealth be earned on the backs of the poor? Will living in this or that place bring me into greater temptation to sin? Does being with this guy make it harder to love the saints, avoid sin, speak the truth, live well? Um, When we're doing the right thing, taking the right next step, Um, doing the good we ought to do, other less obvious decisions and choices have a new clarity. So we're called to be steadfast now in order to be steadfast for the future. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. The right things we know to do are right before us. Seniors, you don't know where you'll be sitting a year from now. Um, Even if you've already been given a job offer, you don't really know where you'll be sitting a year from now. And yes, in my uh, my context as students here, I said, you know, in the senior seminar, uh, when you come back next time, bring your one-year goals, your five-year goals, your 10-year goals. We do that, right? It's, uh, it's, It's the right thing to do, but it's those aren't the things we must depend on. So whatever happened to George Bailey? Uh, George Bailey never got to Europe. He never, he never shook the dust off of this crummy old town of Bedford Falls. Um, he did marry. Uh, marry. They did move into, fix up that old house. Um, he did good. He had friends. He helped the poor get out of slumlord hands and into their own homes. Um, yeah, it wasn't easy. Uh, my family's favorite uh, scene in this movie is be, uh, favorite because they say, oh, that's you, Dad, is G- uh, George Bailey's meltdown, where he says, you call this a happy home? Why do we have to have so many children? 
whoa, okay, that's when my youngest son leaves the room. And he's 30 years old and he still leaves the room at that point. But anyway, <laughs> whatever happened to George Bailey, he did not achieve any of those things he said to Mary out on that walk home uh, on the first night they, they, they were together. In my testimony about this planning for the future, living into the future, I've only learned that I have, all I can do is try to be faithful to what I know to do, to do the work that is expected of me. And yes, that does mean networking, keeping my CV up to date, um, going to the right meetings and all of that. But it also means being open to surprise. All the good things in my life has come, have come as a surprise. Every job I've had has been a surprise to me. Every change in my career or vocation came, I, to, from my perspective, out of left field or out of the blue. Um, that 20th century poet, John Lennon, wrote, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Do the next thing you know you should, do you even know who John Lennon is? He was one of the Beatles. <laughs> he was the smart one. He was the smart one. Um, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. There's a Yiddish proverb. We plan, God laughs. And the, uh, the Christian devotional classic, uh, The Imitation of Christ, man proposes, God disposes. But we have to plan. We have to propose. We have to make other plans because, it's, because otherwise we don't, we don't move. But to learn to do that and to genuinely say, if the Lord wills, to learn to do that and say, uh, Lord, this is what I think I want to do, but surprise me. I'm, it's entirely in your hands. I had, I had nothing by way of career guidance. My, my parents, uh, if I'd asked them, they probably would have. I didn't get career guidance from my parents. I wasn't the stellar student that all the faculty in each context were saying, oh, you know, you need to do this and that, and we'll hook you up with this or whatever. Um, you know, whenever the job changed, it's like, well, I'll talk to a couple friends and go do it, I guess. And uh, there wasn't, you know, I've looked back and I thought, well, gee, that kind of stinks. Either I was really stupid or, or people in my life were really awful. You know, why didn't I get career guidance? So when I look at myself, at my agency in the path of my life, I think I've been kind of unengaged or haphazard or disconnected. But when I look at Jesus, at what God by the Holy Spirit has done, then I see that Jesus led me all the way. I was guided. God provided. My route is not to be derided. At the end, I will not be chided. All the way, my Savior led me. Who have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befalleth, Jesus doeth all things well. I know whatever falleth, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Come on. Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. Still I know whate'er befalleth. Still I know whate'er befalleth. I know whatever happens where Jesus leads me. I know whate'er befalleth. Jesus do with all things well. What will happen to your plans? And how will you respond when life happens while you're making those plans? Put your hand, your heart, your will to the next right thing. I love that phrase. I think Taylor, in the opening, um, opening um, uh, talk in this series, steadfastness is doing the next right thing. P devote your will, your your heart, your hand to the next right thing. Be steadfast today with what you know God wants you to do and trust the God of all knowledge who is also the God of surprises to guide each step through all the life he gives you. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort our hearts and establish us in every good work and word. Would you please stand for the benediction? Oh, no, for the, we're going to sing. Good, we're going to sing uh, Give Me Jesus. Better yet, let's stand and sing.